60 men. Oh, we're just starting now? Okay, I'll start all over. Name is Larry Ryan, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Do you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead, Larry. Start yeah, one more time. You're on now. Larry Ryan, I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is February 25th, 1918. My home group is the Men's Solutions Group in Ponte Vedra Beach. It's a group of about 60 men. We get together. Uh, there's really good sobriety. And afterwards, we all go out to breakfast. Uh, there's usually anywhere from 15 to 25 men go to breakfast together. Saturday morning is the highlight of my week. I enjoy the time before the meeting. I get there early. Enjoy the meeting. Is uh, always a good speaker. It gives us a little inspiration of stuff to talk about. And then the meeting after the meeting at the restaurant, uh, and it usually is a, a pretty good group of people that, and it's a great way for a newcomer to come in and get to, get to introduced to the group and know the people. Uh, I was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York in 1947, October 9th, 1947, uh, and tomorrow is my birthday. So if you don't have a calculator ready, that means I'll be 77 tomorrow. Um, my story, uh, is uh, about my struggles with alcoholism. And it's a little bit different than a lot of most. My, my real problems with alcohol started later in life. I always liked to drink, but it was always pretty much under control. Yeah, there were times when you know, we had a little bit too much, but I always had a goal in mind that I want to reach. And that reach was taking care of my family, providing for them, <clears throat> working my way up to up the ladder in my career. And, uh, I pretty much stuck to that until later on in life. Uh, the um, <clears throat> the stories, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold thing tonight. The uh, the stories that I put in <clears throat> sort of the Debbie Ponderables are all stories about my experience in AA. It's about alcoholism. It's about the fellowship and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Some of them are directly related to things that I have experienced in my own. And a lot of them are things that I hear at a meeting that other members share. And I go home and I'll write about it when I when I, when I I get home uh, because they strike a chord on me and I thought it's worth uh, something to write. It gives me good subject matter. Um, the stories began, I began writing these stories when I was at my last uh, treatment center. It was a place called Willing Way in uh, Statesboro, Georgia. And uh, I'd always been a country music fan, so I had a lot of time, and they said they would, we should write stuff. So I decided I was going to write myself a country music store, a story, so a country music song about uh, alcoholism and alcohol, alcoholism and just drinking in general. So I wrote that story. Now, one of the things I have to con uh, go back to Stephen on, he says that I'm a poet. I don't consider myself a poet. I consider myself a storyteller. My stories just happen to rhyme. <clears throat> going, excuse me, going back to that uh, that country music sort of thing that I was going to write. But it, from then on, it just progressed that way. And always, I would always write a story that had a purpose to it. But I try to make it rhyme for some reason, and it seemed to work for it worked for me anyway. Um, when I was a willing way, I wrote that song, or what I thought was a song. And I'd like to read to you the very, very, very first one that I wrote. It was called The Wrong Side of the Road. When I left home at 17, just looking for some fun, no one thought about tomorrow. My journey's just begun. I'm bulletproof and life is great. My senses overload and forgot all about what mama told me about the wrong side of the road. Now living in a strange new place, but that's part of the game. I'm on a tear and living large. Bartenders know my name. I laugh and joke and drink till two with women young and old. And still I think I'm nowhere near the wrong side of the road. The wrong side of the road, my friend, is not the place to be. It can be happy, it can be happened just by chance or intentionally. So when you start to wander and life seems a heavy load, you may have started drifting to the wrong side of the road. Oh, friends come by, you're feeling good, just like it was before. Well, we're a bit older now and not so self-assured. We still can drink and party hard, yet warning signs forebode that I may be getting closer to the wrong side of the road. Today I wake with aches and pains, can't remember what I've done. I check the car for damages, thank God I have no gun. That's when I come to realize those things that Mama told, 
I know I woke up on the wrong side of the road. The wrong side of the road, my friend, is not the place to be. You may be there accidentally or intentionally. There is no doubt you wandered. Now you bear a heavy load. You know for sure you now crossed onto the wrong side of the road. But maybe just by chance there is another road to take. I've tried and tried to find my way. Please, God, help me for help for heaven's sake. Relieve me of this current thing that has a hold on me. For with your hope in those 12 steps, at last I may be free. The wrong side of the road, my friend, is not the place to be. It can happen just by accident or intentionally. I pray my higher power will be there as I've been told and keep me safe a long way from the wrong side of the road. I pray to get delivered from the wrong side of the road. And that was what started it all. Um, my journey through sobriety, uh, I, I, my songs uh, broken down, into, to pretty much taken a, a, a page out of the big book, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And the songs that I write are all into those three categories. Um, so um, it started off with what it was like. When I came into AA, I had questions about, am I really an alcoholic? And I started to think, why am I an alcoholic? What caused me to be an alcoholic? <clears throat> my father was an alcoholic. And I thought, well, it must be because my father was, it's inherited me. I have to be getting my alcoholism from my father. But then another thought occurred to me, but maybe it's, I learned to be an alcoholic as life went on. Years ago, when I was about 10 years old, I was out on a boat with my father and my uncle. And <clears throat> we came back from fishing, put the boat on the trailer, hooked it up to the truck. And we got in the truck, and when we did, my father took, found a, a, a pint of uh, whiskey under the, under the seat and pulled it out. And he and my uncle would go back and forth drinking this pint of whiskey, and they finished the whole damn thing. And I was sitting there watching this and saying, hmm, well, <clears throat> I guess that's what, the way men drink. Um, fast forward to uh, a playhouse of my friends. Uh, when we were, I was now about 12 years old. And I went to the playhouse and we would go there and uh, hide out and, and talk and do silly things that 12-year-olds uh, do. And, and one day my, my friend pulled out a bottle, of a half a pint of whiskey. And he looked around and said, what do you think? Should we try it? Well, there were four of us and we all kind of nodded our head. Yeah, let's, let's give it a try. Um, so we passed the bottle around and I was the last one in the line. And the first three took a sip of their bottle and made a funny face. And, uh, but then my turn came and I grabbed the bottle and I took a big old chug. I was going to show them how real men drink whiskey. Uh, well, that was uh, that was then, and that was the way I had learned how to have men drink. And I just figured, well, that's the way it's going to be. That's the way you drink whiskey. You don't sip it, you drink it. So it could be learned. It could be uh, taught. I think it's a combination of the two. Besides uh, being around my father, who was an alcoholic, and have the, uh, the Irish blood in me, uh, it, it's a combination of uh, learning and teaching. Um, I learned a lot of other things from my dad. He was a good man, but he was an alcoholic. Uh, he uh, had good and bad habits. He worked hard. He always provided for the family, but he was always a very selfish man. Uh, when he wanted to do something, it didn't matter what was going on in the world. If he wanted to go hunting, he's going hunting. And he would uh, go whether there was a, an anniversary or a birthday party or whatever, he would do it. And that kind of filtered into me. I was always been a very selfish person until until I really got sober and, and had to look at myself and realize what I was doing. Um, I didn't really drink again until I was in high school. I was, I guess, my sophomore or junior in high school, and uh, I really felt self conscious when I went to went to high school. I had been in Catholic school for the last eight years, and. Catholic school was very different than public schools, uh, irregardless of the religious side of it. And I saw people there; uh, they were they were not they were not dressed. They weren't in uniforms. They uh, were cutting up. They were doing things, and I felt a little out of place. Uh, the first time I was called on in school to stand up uh, to to read something or to say something, I stood up, and all the classmates start to giggle. And I realized that they're giggling at me because I'm standing because nobody does that in these schools. 
Well, that was the last time I stood up. I learned that section re that really fast, but I still felt out, uh, like an outsider. <clears throat> and I wanted to be one of the cool kids. And I knew the cool kids would drink beer. And I said, well, maybe that's what I need to do. I really had a desire to fit in. So I would go to beach parties with uh, some of the fellows and then we'd start drinking beer. And we had a ritual we would do. It was called uh, Mr. Misty. The uh, only two restaurants at the beach at that time was a pizza place called Nick's and it was the Dairy Queen. And Dairy Queen is still there today. And we would go to the Dairy Queen and we'd get a, a big, the biggest Mr. Misty cup we could find. And then we'd go outside and we'd pour it out because they wouldn't let you just buy the cup. And we then would fill it up with beer. And on, on the weekends and Saturdays and Sundays, we'd ride down the beach with our Mr. Misty cup. And as other members would come by and pass us, we'd always kind of salute each other with the Mr. Misty cup. Everybody knew it was in it. So it was kind of a, a fun thing to do when you're, when you're that age. Um, after that, after my college years, um, I decided that I wanted to leave Florida and go to New York. I wanted to see the excitement of the big fig, big fig, big sister. So I did. I, I went to New York where I had some relatives and I figured they'd let me stay there until I decided what I wanted to do. And at that time, there was something called Woodstock that was being talked about. And I said, well, that sounds like something I want to try. So I did go to Woodstock. It was three horrible days. I mean, the music was great, but you were mud up to your knees. The bathroom facilities were almost non-existent. They ran out of food by the second day. It was not a pleasant, pleasant experience, but what the hell, it was Woodstock. So I left there and I came back to New York and I figured, well, it's time for me to get a job. So I went looking into Manhattan and I went into this uh, uh, New York, big New York bank. And I interviewed with them and they said, yeah, we'd like to have you come on board. I said, well, we have two divisions in the bank. One is domestic and one is international. Which one you would like to choose? <laughs> that was a no-brainer. International, baby. Get me on the get me on the road. So I got a job with them in the international division, and I was working in the back office of the foreign exchange trading room. That was where they processed the trades that the dealers would make. The bank, people in the bank are usually pretty laid back and cool. It's uh, gentlemanly, it's organized. And every so often I have to go into the trading room. And when I went into the trading room, what I saw blew my mind. There was none of that bank atmosphere in there. It was, it was animal house all over again. People were yelling, screaming, throwing phones, cursing, just going crazy. And I said, that's what I want to do for a living. I want to be one of those guys. So the, uh, the, the the alcoholic thinking was already there. It was already stirring around in my mind. Plus the fact that I heard that those guys made pretty good money. So I said, yeah, let me give that thing a try. Let me give that thing a try. I stayed in that business for about 25 years. Uh, and I rode up to the rank of a senior vice president in the bank. And uh, I wasn't in New York all the time. I worked in London for a while. And then they sent me out to Los Angeles when we opened up a new bank, out a new office out there. And I did that for quite a while until the age of about 46. And at that point, the bank decided that they were going to move their headquarters to Long Island. Well, I lived in central New Jersey. And central New Jersey and central Long Island might have been, might as well have been on Mars. It was so far away. So I knew there was no way I could do that. So my wife and I had a talk. What are we going to do? Am I going to look for another trading job? Uh, and I was pretty well sick of the, the trading racket. I'd been doing it for 25 years, getting phone calls at 2 o'clock in the morning from Singapore. Yeah. I said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, just forget about this and let's move to Florida? So we decided to do that. So we went ahead and, and we moved to Florida. Uh, when we got there, I started looking for businesses that I could own. And I I interviewed with, I interviewed probably a dozen different companies. And I decided on this one business that I thought I would be able to run as a, just manage the business and let the people do the job. It didn't actually work out that way because I didn't know what in the hell I was doing. And two years uh, without a paycheck, I decided, well, maybe this is probably not the best idea. Uh, let me try something else. During those two years, one of the companies that I had uh, looked at previously, the salesman for the company had kept calling me every six months. He'd give me a call. Hey, how you doing? We'd love to have you have one of our offices, we'll open up our offices in Jacksonville. And so the timing was right. I was ready to close this business and he just called me and I said, okay, 
Let's take a look at that. So I did. I looked at it and I decided it was a pretty lucrative business. Let me give it a shot. And I got two of my brothers uh, who had their own businesses, but I had them look at it and they saw the potential and they agreed to close their business down and come and work with me in, in my business. Um, I was in, that was in 1995, uh, 1998. And I was uh, involved, heavily involved with the business until 1918, upon which time I actually departed from the business and I went into retirement. <clears throat> I always considered myself a social drinker. I never really, uh, alcohol didn't have control of my life up until this point. Uh, I was, uh, I liked to drink, I enjoyed it. And there were times that uh, people were getting, my wife was getting a little annoyed that I would have a little bit too much. Uh, but I still thought that I could handle it. Um, what happened to change that was a, a story that this Irishman that I was talking about, he came to my house um, in New Jersey where we would have parties in New Jersey. Uh, and people would come from as far away as Connecticut and, and uh, Delaware, because we were central in the uh, location. They would come to our house for the weekend. People didn't ask what time it started. They said, what day does it start? So we would have people there for all, the whole weekend, and it would be a good bunch of people, and everybody was drinking and having fun. But it wasn't out of control. And one particular meeting, one particular the, uh, gathering we had on a Sunday night, everybody's getting to leave, and my friend gets in his car with his family and gets packs up his family and ready to go and get in his car and leave. And all of a sudden the door opens and he comes running back into the house. And I said, what did you forget? And he didn't even talk to me. He just ran over the bar. He grabbed the hold of a got bottle of scotch and just choked it back down, put it down and just went run, running back out. I looked at him and said, damn, my friend might be an alcoholic. Well, fast forward 20 years. Now I'm living in Florida. And I'm at my house and I have people over. There was about two or three couples there. And we're sitting outside by the pool and everybody's having a drink and everything's fine. And a couple of the glasses needed to be refilled. So being the good, gracious host that I am, I went inside to uh, fill up the glasses and I did. And as I was walking, just about ready to go back outside, some, I stopped and put the glasses down and I went back to the bar and grabbed a bottle of vodka and chugged a bottle of vodka down. And I went and picked up the glasses and I brought them back out. And as I brought them back out and put them on the table, that thought of my friend stirred in my mind and I said, shit, maybe I'm an alcoholic. But my next thought was, yeah, but I can handle it. Like we all have done at one point in time. Uh, well, actually I couldn't handle it. Uh, the recession in the business from 2008 to 2010, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the economy went into recession and our business took a hit. Uh, we had three offices at that time. I had been working out of each office. And we, because of the lack of business, we had to cut expenses. So we closed down two of the, th two of the three offices. We just had a main office uh, in Jacksonville. And uh, since I had been working at the beach, we had closed the beach office. I decided that, well, I can do what I have to do from home. I can run our, my part of the business from home, which I did. I could actually take care of what I had to do within about an hour. The problem with that was uh, my wife was still working, so it was just me all alone by myself, and boredom set in. So I would decide, well, maybe I'll have a beer with lunch. Pretty good. The next day, well, it was two beers at lunch. Before long, lunch was starting at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then, lunch, lunch, then, then beer turned to vodka at 7. And at that point, the race was on. Um, I, again, I was semi-retired uh, at that point, but I was still involved in the business. But in 2010, I came, business was picking up and we needed me back, back in the main office. So I came into the back office. I came back into the office and now I'm 63 years old. My part of the business was business administration. Uh, handling the paperwork, payroll, uh, taxes, that sort of stuff. And I could do that stuff again within an hour. And I had the rest of the day in the office to do nothing, twiddle my thumbs and answer the phone. And I became really uh, disenchanted with the business. I didn't really want to be there. And I kind of made it known. People knew that I really didn't want to be there. Yeah. So uh, 
20, uh, 2012, uh, there was an intervention. Uh, I was sitting out again at home by my pool, sitting outside, uh, having a, a couple of cocktails. And in walks my wife, my two daughters and their husbands and my three business partners. And they said, uh, something's got to change. They said, you need to get help. They'd already made arrangements for me to go to a, a, a rehab facility called, uh, called uh, Wakaiba Springs in Jacksonville. And I didn't put up an argument at all. I knew they were right. I knew I was drinking too much. I needed to do something. So I figured, well, maybe this Wakaiba Springs will show me how to drink properly. That was the mindset that I went into this rehabilitation center for. <laughs> I was only there for five days. But when I left, they said, you need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I said, okay, I knew. I, again, I was doing all of this to please other people. It wasn't for me. I was doing it to get my wife on my back, get my business partners uh, off my back. So I said, yeah, I'll go to AA. And I started to go to AA. Um, the next, I was, I, I, when I came out, I went into an IOP for 30 days. And then I came out <clears throat> and I was sober for about 40 days. And then the urge for a drink hit me. And coming home from Monday night meeting, I stopped off and got a, a pint of vodka. And I drank about half of it. By the time I got home, I had a pretty good buzz on. But I felt remorse from what I'd done. So I figured I'd better call my sponsor and tell him. And I did. I called my sponsor and told him what I'd done. And he said, well, let me I'll just give you one piece of advice. <clears throat> the next time that urge comes on, give me a call before you drink. And I said, that's damn good advice. Of course, I didn't listen to it, but it was really good advice. Um, the next four years was pretty much the same on and off, in and out. I had experienced uh, times of sobriety, three months here, six months there. In fact, I even had 22 months at one point. <clears throat> but at this 22 month uh, juncture, a thought came to me that maybe my problem is that I drink too fast. And the reason that I drink too fast is because I'm having to hide my drinking because you have to hide it, take the drink and put it back in hiding again. So I said, if I just didn't have to hide my drink, I'd probably be all right. So I gave that a try. Well, needless to say, that didn't work. And within a very short time, it was back to the old way of doing things. Uh, that uh, that the philosophy of uh, drinking, uh, hiding your drinking and, and not having to rush it didn't kind of come work out the way I would hope it would. But again, I kept saying, well, you know, I'm drinking, but I'm still, I'm not that bad. I haven't been arrested. I haven't wrecked a car. I still have my finances are good. I still have my family intact. Uh, so I can't be that bad. And then I realized later on that the worst thing that ever happened to me trying to get sober was that the worst thing never happened to me. I didn't have these calamities happen to me that I hear so many people talk about in AA meetings. And again, it kept reinforcing the fact that I'm not that bad. Well, um, 2016 comes along and my uh, my business partners and I get together for a meeting and it's kind of decided that you really don't want to be here, do you? And I said, well, I really don't. And I said, well, I'll go start working from home again because I was still coming into the office. Um, they said, no, that's probably not going to work. Uh, we think it's best if you leave the business, which is the business that I started and got them in. And I said, how dare they do this to me? But I mean, it was absolutely right. They were correct to do that. And so I decided to sell my shares in the business to, to my partners. And I went off to a, another rehab called Willingway in uh, Statesboro, Georgia. Um, and I was there for 28 days. But again, that was not the answer. I was again doing it for other people, not for me. So I came out of there. And for the next two years, it was more of the same, more of the same on and off drinking, hiding it, trying to be pretend I was a good uh, a sober alcoholic, but it, 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 the truth was it was that wasn't what it was. I'd like to read to you something that kind of goes along with us. It's called Alone in a Crowd. And this is where I was at when I finally went ahead to go willing way. I know these people very well, some neighbors, some akin. I greet them all, a welcome smile, a handshake and a grin. But then I feel it coming. I want to shout out loud. Surrounded by so many, yet alone within a crowd. It hasn't always been that way. I like to be with folks. We laughed and drank and carried on. Life was a big joke. I liked my job. The pay was good. I would reason to be proud. When playtime came, off I would go, a member of the crowd. Many times I couldn't wait to be with all my, all my mates. 
anticipate the fun we'd have alone or even with dates. But now and then I drank too much. At first it was allowed, but as time passed and things progressed, I parted from the crowd. What, was, what, it, what is it about folks like us that make us feel this way, alone within a crowded room with so few words to say? While others laugh, enjoy themselves in that calm and ease, we drink we drink to grasp that what they have and controlling, but controlling our disease. Without the drink, I am alone, afraid and insecure. Can't, can't, can't comprehend how fit in or whether my secret or whether I am secure. But once I let the cork out and come out and get, get, on my, get with my friends, my world has changed. I'm good to go. I need, uh, I need to still pretend. As time goes on, I just get worse. My life divide, devoid of fun. I drink and watch the world go by, waiting, waiting for the sun, waiting for the setting sun. For it's that time when I'm asleep, I do not have to think, or where or how I find a way to get my next drink. There's friends I knew, so I needed help if I'm to whip this thing. But the hold the bottle had on me would never, would never remove the sting. Don't need your help, I tell them. It's just what the way I am. So go away, leave me alone. I just don't give a damn. Now things have changed. I'm not alone as people come to see. Me laying there all still and calm, as dead as I can be. It took some time, but there I lay all covered in the shroud. No more to feel the way I did, surrounded by my crowd. And that was kind of the way I was at the end. I really felt alone, totally alone. And there were times I never thought about suicide. But there were many times that I would go to bed and say, if I don't wake up tomorrow, that'll be okay. Because I'd pretty much given up. So what happened? I went, uh, after I got home from Willingway, like I said, it continued for a couple of years. And I, I had a, an event happen that was really the turning point. My wife was uh, on a trip to visit our daughter in, in Austin, Texas at the time. And every time she went out of town, I would always, that was my, the drinking lamp would light. And it was time for me to I can sit and drink and not have to worry about hiding it. But as I always did, when my wife went out of town, I'd always call her and just check and see how she was doing. Now, at this time, they were using this thing called FaceTime. And I'd never used it, but I saw them using it. I said, well, I'll call, I'll call my wife on FaceTime, which I thought was a great idea. And I did, it worked. And we talked for about 15 minutes or 10 minutes. And I thought that went well, and I hung up. About an hour later, I get a call from my wife and said, I know you've been drinking. You're not taking Jimmy to his bowling tomorrow. We have a son with Down syndrome. Uh, he lives alone. He's very high functioning. But on Saturdays, he would go to uh, uh, his special Olympics bowling. And my wife would not let me take him. She didn't trust me. So she had a friends of ours come and pick him up and take him. That hit me like a ton of bricks. It made me think, what and who have I who have I turned into? I can't even take my my special needs son to his Olympics. And I actually sat there and cried. That was when the psychic change occurred. I wanted to be the man that I used to be. I wanted to be the man that was a good father, a good husband, a good a good brother, uh, someone who was respected by his family. And I had lost all that. That was gone. And I made up my mind then and there that I was going to do that. I wanted that more than I wanted a drink. Call it a, a spiritual awakening. I call it a psychic change. But whatever it is, something had something changed in me that day. And I, for, and I haven't had a drink since that day. And that was almost six years ago. Um, now, when I made that decision, I found that my 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 getting getting sober came in four stages. And the four stages I call need, urge, desire, and thought. The fee, the need for alcohol went away very quickly. That wasn't a big deal. And you know, years ago I used to have to get it to just to settle my nerves, but that went by fast. The urge took a lot longer because every so often that urge would come on and just want me to pull in. And, and I remember one time I was driving seven o'clock in the morning, uh, I was out driving and uh, the urge came on and I pulled into a, one of these little convenience stores and got a 16 ounce beer. And I went up to pay for my beer and the guy said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't send you that beer. It's not seven o'clock yet. I said, but you don't understand my meeting starts at seven o'clock. Well, anyway, I didn't get the beer, I went to the meeting, but it took a while for that urge to finally to dissipate. But there are two other things that I had to, had to confront. One was desire and the other was thought. 
the desire part would come on me, uh, even though I'd been sober now for a while. I would be sitting at home watching the show I used to usually watch was uh, that one with uh, the family cop, uh, I think what the name of it was. They would all be sitting around the table at the end of the uh, at the end of the meal, sitting around and drinking. Everybody has a glass of wine, and I would look at that and say, "Yeah, man, I miss that. I wish I wish I could do that." That was the desire part. But again, that's all it went. It was it was there and it was gone. I knew it. I, I knew I wasn't going to drink, but the desire was there. Uh, and that happens quite often. Uh, even uh, a few years ago, I had a, the same thing happen when I was on a, on a trip uh, with a bunch of people on a, on, a, on, a, on a journey out to the Rockies. And people were sitting around in this bar called the Great Cowboy Bar out in, uh, in Colorado. And uh, everybody was having beers and everything. And again, the thought crossed my mind, it would be nice to be able to do that. But then the next thought was, Get serious. You can't do that. You know you can't do that. And then the thought would pass one. The last stage is the thought stage. And I am pretty convinced that I will never lose the thought stage. You're walking into a, a grocery store and you see a new brand of vodka or a, a new Irish whiskey that's that's got a flavor to it. And the thought would come on, I wonder what that would be like. But then again, it's one of those things you keep on walking and it's gone. I mean, and even recently, I was in my car uh, listening to the radio, listening to the uh, the Margaritaville station and uh, Jimmy Buffett song came on that I'd never heard before. It's called my, my, my gummies just kicked in. I had given up drugs 50 years ago and I had no intention of wanting to use drugs, but the thought of gummies, I never, I wonder what that would be like just to have a gummy. So the thought was there, but again, of course, the next thought was that's stupid. Get out of here leave it alone. And I didn't. So that was not a, that was not a big deal, but those thoughts, I'm sure there will be times in the future when that thought will come, but it's a passing thought. Like we're saying, you know, you're not responsible for your first thought, but you are for your second. And the second thought was no way. So anyway, that, that was my, my turning point. And, and that's uh, what, what really got me seriously involved with becoming a member of AA and not just going to AA, which there was a big difference. Um, At this time, there was another, I was in a meeting. Let me do it at the time. Okay, I've got to cut this, cut this short a little bit. Uh, there was, I'm going to get to the recovery stage. I was going to read another one, but I'll pass on that and go to the recovery stage. The recovery stage uh, begins, like I said, between week one and two, and they were pretty well gone. Next stage is two and three. But every time they would come on, I would remember the nine step prayer, and that would help me uh, combat any of these uh, thoughts that I might have. Uh, because I use the ninth step prayer as a reminder. I don't regret my past, but I use my past as a reminder to remember how I felt on that Friday afternoon when my wife told me I couldn't take my son to the take him to the Special Olympics bowling, and I I knew I didn't want to ever feel that way again. Um, I don't do this. I don't do the steps every day. I don't do every all the steps every day, but I do step one every single day. But step one is for me reminding myself that I am an alcoholic and I had to take medicine for it. And my medicine is my routine. I have a routine that I do when I get out of bed before I do anything else. <clears throat> it consists of prayer, meditation, and reading. And usually it's the day and ponderables is what I'm reading in the morning. It takes about 10 minutes uh, to, to, to about so 30 minutes to complete the process. But I do it every day, and it doesn't matter where I am. I just came back from a trip to a, to a cruise to Hawaii uh, last last Sunday night, <clears throat> and even when I was going on the cruise ship, I brought my 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 routine with me. Uh, I, when I'm packing my bag, I make sure I pack my routine to bring it with me. So it doesn't matter whether I'm at home, whether I'm on a vacation home somewhere, or if I'm on a cruise ship or an airplane. I have to do my routine and that's what's going to keep me grounded. And then I can face whatever happened. I wasn't able to make a uh, an AA meeting on the on the boat. I went down there with the friends of Bill's they're supposed to meet and nobody showed up. So I did that two nights in a row and, and finally realized that it was not going to happen. So, But I still have my routine to keep me strong. And that's what I, I bank on every day. And I, I just can't express the, the importance of what my routine is to keep me on balance, keep me on the right track. Um, but even having said that, I found that uh, to stay sober, I needed more than just my what I call my maintenance meeting. That's the meeting I go to every day. So I need two other types of meetings to help me stay on track. 
The first meeting is what I used to do at MHRC, the Mental Health Resource Center, where see, I need to see people who are down and out, uh, who are really at the end and suffering. <laughs> or a newcomer comes in and listen to his story. I need to hear that as a reminder of where I was and where I don't want to be again. The other one I need to see is when, when uh, we're in a meeting with somebody who has good sobriety, long-term sobriety, goes out. There was a fellow who had 35 years of sobriety and he shocked the whole group when he told us that he went out. I need to see that. This man was Mr. AA. I would have never, I would have bet my life that this man would never drink and he did. And the thought comes to me, well, hell, if it can happen to him, it can happen to me. I know I can never have another drink again, but I don't know that I will never have a drink again. And for that reason, I have to do my routine every day. I can't let up on it. I can't, I can't coast. I've got to stay focused on the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the Fellowship of Alcohol, Alcohol Anonymous, and my routine. And that, that, that keeps me sober because there is a fear that the, this could happen to me like it happened to it and some other people. Uh, during my, during my, my, my drinking days, um, this is how things, things have changed. My daughter and her son uh, and my daughter and her husband came to our house and uh, they confronted me and said, you know, we're not going to let the grandkids come to the house anymore. Uh, we don't feel that we really want them being around you. And I said, and I was still in my drinking stage. So I said, okay, well, that's the way you want it. That's fine with me. And I didn't really care that they were doing this. But then it occurred to me that it was not me that they were really hurting. It was my wife. My wife loved the grandkids. And the fact that the grandkids come to the house and go overnight and we couldn't do things on our own with the grandkids, she was really, really torn up about that. Um, my wife and I have been next in November, we'll be married 53 years. My wife stood through me all the bad times, all the good times, all the bad times, but she always stood by me. And I knew I had to do this as well as for myself. I had to do it for, I had to do this so she could have the grandkids come over again. Uh, once I had finally made that decision that I wanted alcohol, I wanted sobriety for me. Uh, I was about a year sober and I went to my daughter's house. And I talked to her and uh, her husband and I explained to them that, you know, this is what's happened. I've had this awakening. I've had the psychic change and uh, alcohol is not a part of my life anymore. And I would love to have the grandkids back to come. And they saw they had seen the change in me and they knew it was they knew it was for real this time. And they agreed. So now we can take the grandkids. They can come over and spend the night. In fact, two weeks ago, my 18 year old granddaughter came over and spent the night with us. I wanted to be with her grandparents strange but it uh it, it was so good to have them back so now we take them down to uh the uh all the different places to disney and we take them to the animal farm and take them on zip lines and do things with the kids that uh, we finally made that we got back to where we were and i realized that you know i i actually have become the man i wanted to be again it took a long time and a long hard road to do it but i've gotten that man back um there are times in my spot, but uh, there are times in my my program, my my sobriety, when things happen, and I don't realize that it the program has taken over. Uh, a few years ago, I had <clears throat> a bad cases of bronchitis, and I called my doctor's office and said, um, "Can you get me in? I need to I need to come into the office." And they said, "Well, I'm sorry, but we don't have any." Uh, appointments for you. He said, however, we can we can do one of those video health calls at 8.30 tomorrow morning. And I said, well, that's fine. Let's do that. So 8.30 came and I'm sitting at my computer waiting for it. And nine o'clock came and 9.30 came. Finally, about 10 o'clock, I got fed up and said, this isn't going to work. So I just got up and left and I drove to one of those instant care places. Now, not having an appointment there, I had to sit there and wait for two hours as well. And I finally saw a nurse practitioner and she wrote me a prescription for what I needed. And I walked out the door. By this time, I was not in a good mood. I had been turned down by my doctor. They didn't call me. I had to wait two hours. I was going to get in my car and call that doctor's office and give them a piece of my mind. And I was reaching to push the button on the phone. when all of a sudden occurred to me that what good would that do? You like your doctor. Yeah, I like my doctor. 
I don't know what happened in that office would cause this to happen. They've never let me down before. Why am I going to do that and become a complete jerk? And I didn't make the call. That was the program working me. That was not me working the program. That was that was the program taking over. And I really, when I didn't do it, I felt a lot better about it. I said, yeah, maybe I have made a little progress that I didn't act out of, out of turn. So I get home and uh, I hadn't looked at my messages for the last uh, day or for the last day and a half. And I opened up my message and there's a message from the doctor's office saying, oh, we've had a cancellation. We could fit you in at 10 o'clock. So not only did I not I did, I did, that I did the right thing by not calling him, but also the fact that I didn't make a complete ass of myself by calling up the doctor and when they had already offered me another uh, another uh, appointment and uh, it was my fault that they didn't take it and I didn't they call and give them hell about it. So I find that the, the the program quite often ends up working me even when I'm not doing it. So even though I only do purposely step one every day. The other program, the other parts of the program kick in during the day and it can be at this funniest times, but I know it's, I know what it's, when it happens, I know why it's happening. Um, Stephen asked me to, uh, to, uh, uh, to be this, to, to put the, the face behind the, uh, the poems, as he calls them. Um, I, I, I immediately said, yes, I'll do it, because now I'm not having to go to that mental health research center on Tuesday nights, and I said I'd be happy to do it. Um, it's been an honor to speak to you all. I thank you for putting up with me and listening to my story. And I'll just give you one last, uh, one last little thing that I wrote, and this is kind of sums it up. It's called On Cruise Control, and that's where I'm at now. When driving in my car, I set the thing on cruise control. It keeps my speed in balance as I watch the models unfold. Until something occurs that will require my attention, I then become alert so that the problem is corrected. With some years in the program, I take sobriety for granted. Recovery on cruise control, AA has been implanted. I go up by my day immune from liquor's raw appeal. When suddenly a thing occurs that upsets the whole deal. I went to help my son whose kitchen faucet started leaking. I saw the problem, searched for the tools. I searched to find the tools, the tools that I would need it. I looked around and found something that took me by surprise. It was not tools, but something else. A vision caught my eyes. A cabinet, all alone, a jug of Irish whiskey. I only rarely bought the stuff, because I needed to be thrifty. Although I really liked it, store brand vodka was my vice. The same result from both of them, and one was third the price. The memory, how good it tastes, quickly went away. I knew not to romanticize, to put those thoughts at bay. I shut the door, conti continued on the job I had begun. Those thoughts never did reoccur. I knew that they were done. A week had passed, and in my sleep, I had a drinking dream. This had not happened for some years, amazed how real it seemed. I dreamt I was back at my son's and opened up that door, saw the bottle standing there, the same way as before. But in the dream, I did not shut the door and walk away. I could not put those old thoughts down. My mind would not obey. I grabbed the bottle in my hand and took a mighty drink. When I awoke at first ashamed, then I began to think. What caused me after all those years to have a dream like that? My program sound, routine is tact, how something gone amiss? It's then I thought of cruise control, of how I was of how I was assured that buying do what I'm doing, I actually have been cured. The dream was a good lesson. One I needed to review. Although the urge to drink is gone, I still have work to do. The fact that in my dream, the whiskey still had an appeal. Subconsciously, I'm still at risk unless I do the deal. I can't take it for granted that I'll never drink again. I only have one day, today, my problem to it, my program to extend. I might get by on cruise control, but can't take it for granted. I'm still an alcoholic. This disease is still implanted. And one last story I will give you. It's very quick. It's about one of us. Fella goes into a bar and he orders a shot of whiskey. And the bartender comes up and gives him a shot of whiskey. And the bartender takes a shot of whiskey and puts it, or the, the drinker takes it and puts it over on the side and says, Bartender, I want another shot of whiskey. And he gives him another shot of whiskey. And the guy takes it and he downs that shot of whiskey just like that. And the bartender's sitting there and scratching his head and thinking, Well, you know, what's this all about? And he said, I asked Ransky, why did you do that? You took that one and you put it in the side and then you drink the second one. He said, well, look, I tell you, it's kind of like this. Lately, he said, I've been going to this place, these, some of these AA meetings. And uh, the one thing I keep hearing them say, whatever you do, just don't take that first drink.
with that, I will leave you. Thank you very much for living. Thanks, Stephen, for, uh, for having me speak to this group. And uh, I wish you all good night and good well. Thank you.